this is, I've done this, and I'm ready to face it, but I would love to go. So yeah, like I said, um, I'm, I'm just going to go through for everything in this room is audio and video recorded first right. off. Are you okay, okay with that? Oh yes. Okay. So I just want to go through, like I said, a couple formalities, cover a few little things off, things that I have to do on my end that I, I, I right. need to do, and uh, things that I just want to tell you and make sure that we're all on the same page before we, uh, before we get going. Okay. Okay. So first off, um, Today is Wednesday, October the 5th, 2016, and on my phone right now, I'll just use that as a, a time reference, it's 514, okay. so 1714, we'll just use that as a start time of our conversation here today. Um, again, my name is Nathan Hergott with the Woodstock Police Service, I currently work in our crime unit, okay. and uh, we met a short time ago in downtown Toronto, correct? Yes. Right? Yes. So, um, we came to a facility where you've spent the last uh, few weeks, from what I understand, Yes. And uh, we met with Dr. Khan and, yes. and his team of uh, associates, yes. and I believe you were under his care for the last little while, correct? Yeah, for the last three weeks. Okay. And uh, the process, how, how we got here basically is um, kind of offered you a ride back, and, and so we could have this conversation, and, and you gracefully accepted, and uh, off we went down uh, the 401, or the, well, the, the gardener, the QW, yep. and the, and the 403, and, 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 and here we are, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so just to make it clear for whoever might watch this in the future, um, we didn't force you to come with us. We didn't, uh, you know, shove you in the car and off we went kind of thing. You did it yeah. on your own free will and, and you accepted it on your own, uh, on your own decision making. Yeah. Is that no. correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I had enough and you even let me try to give money to the homeless people. So. There you go. I remember all of that. I remember all that. So I, I know I read you a few things before, um, as we were kind of just cruising down Spadina there. Um, and I know you've been read this many times, but it's just things that we need to just reiterate and, and make sure that you're clear and comfortable with, okay. with having this conversation today. Okay. Okay. Um, like I said, um, based on our investigation, there could be some, some pretty serious criminal charges that result of, yeah. of our investigation. Okay. Yeah. So having said that, if, if you wish to speak to a lawyer at any time, okay. I don't want you to hesitate. Uh, we can make it happen whenever you like. So okay. whether it's now, five minutes from now, an hour from now, or three days from now, whatever the case may be. We're not going to be asking questions for three days, are we? I hope not. No, I hope <laughs> okay. not. I'm just, using, I'm just saying that any time that you want to speak to a lawyer, that you're kind of in our company or whatever the case may be, you let us know and, and we can make that accommodation for okay. you. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Okay, because you, in your position uh, as a Canadian citizen, you're, uh, you're entitled to have free legal advice from a legal aid Okay. Uh, duty counsel lawyer, a lawyer of your choice, whoever you like. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and like I said, because there could be some criminal charges that, that result of our investigation. Right. Okay. Um, also, and I know you've been read this many times before, that you may be charged uh, with many criminal offenses, um, and you don't have to say anything in answer to the charges that you face, but if you wish to do so, um, we're going to do that today. Um, but whatever you do say could be used in, in court. And I know we had that conversation in the car on the way, on the yeah. way uh, back to Woodstock. Yeah. And I asked you to repeat it in your own words, and you kind of gave us a few, uh, a few of, of describing it in your own vocabulary. As you said something like, it's not Vegas. What happens in the car on the way back doesn't necessarily stay in the car. Right? Yeah. So okay. same thing same thing in this room. Anything that you okay. say and everything that we talked about could be used as evidence at court. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So kind of to put it easily, the same rules apply, okay? okay? Um, and if you've spoken to any other police officers, I know that you've dealt with uh, the Toronto police Toronto, officers. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, a couple officers in the car on our, on our trip back here. Um, if anyone's persuaded you or tried to push you into making a statement, whatever they said, I don't want that to influence no. you in any way, okay? No, what I'm about to, to say, I've, I've, 
I'm giving up my own free will. Okay. All right. And I appreciate that. Um, and we'll get moving forward. For another few things, and I know that we said this in the car, you are not under arrest right now. Okay. Okay, I want to make that very clear to you. Okay. Okay, you're not under arrest. The door is unlocked. Okay, I'm not impeding your way to the door. If you want to leave at any time, if you want to stop talking to me at any time, you just let me know. And, okay. uh, and we'll just carry on from there. Okay. Okay, but you're not being held here against your will. Uh, we're not yeah. forcing you to speak to us. Um, we just have some follow-up, some uh, some follow-up questions from the investigation that kind of okay. got going while you were in Toronto. Yeah, being interviewed is hard because it takes so long. It does. Um, so I'll do my best. Like if, like I said, if I have to get up and pace around a bit or whatever. If you want to take a break at any time, you let us know. If you want to get up and pace around, I'll just kind of hang tight here and yeah. we'll just keep conversing as long as uh, as long as you're comfortable. Um, I'll go as long as I can. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, that's kind of all the formalities, but, but like I said, uh, those are the, the things that I just wanted to make sure that were, were clear to you. And if you have any questions for me before we get started, <coughs> the floor is yours. Is, is there no. anything or any concerns that you have? No, I just, I want to get through this and find out what happened to my mom and dad, because I know they're upset because someone went to visit them today. Okay. And I visited them today, and they said, you know, they're here, we're concerned, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine that, and I honestly don't have those answers for you, okay. but I can get them for you. Um, okay. My role in this investigation so far has been not as in depth as some of the other officers, um, okay. but my my task today obviously was to travel to Toronto and, and meet with you with with my fellow co-workers, yeah. and uh, and come back here and, and have a conversation. So that's kind of where where I'm at right now, but I can definitely get those okay. answers for you, and, and I don't want to upset any more people that need to be, uh, especially your mom and dad. Yeah. Okay. You should have bought blue, t blue t tickets when you were there. You know what? If I could afford them for the playoffs, I probably would have. Yeah, that was exciting last night. Um, so just just for the record, and I know you, you prefer to go by Beth is what you told yeah. me. Is that correct? Yeah. Can you just state your full name for me? Elizabeth Tracy May Wettwalfer. Tracy May? Yep. Okay, and just spell your last name for the record. W-E-T-T-L-A-U-S-E-R. Perfect. Um, and Beth, the reason why we're here today is because uh, we've received some information uh, back at the end of last week um, with regards to um, some information that was provided to the Toronto Police Service, mm -hmm. um, which has led us into uh, quite a bit of work and, and leads us here today to speak to you with regards to kind of how this all started and, and yeah. follow up. But basically, um, I've, I've watched your statement that you provided to Toronto. Okay. Okay. And we've been provided uh, this document here. Does that look familiar? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. All right. And from what I can see here, there's four pages of a uh, handwritten document. Is that your handwriting? Yes, it is. Okay. And it just kind of goes through um, some people that you've encountered in, in your career uh, from 2007 through to 2016 of August. Yeah. Uh, August of 2016. Okay. So, so that's kind of the, the focus of our investigation right now is right. the information that you you put on these four pieces of paper. Yes. Okay. Um, but but before we get into that, I just want to kind of get an idea of, of your career and, and where you kind of where you've been in your career and um, kind of how you got into things and. Registered nurse. I started from call. I started from with from uh, here in Park uh, Secondary School. I. Um, <coughs> I graduated grade 13, went for a year of law school, not law school, sorry, journalism school. Okay. And uh, then uh, went to uh, Bible College, yeah. London Baptist Bible College in London. Graduated with a degree in uh, counseling, with a bachelor's degree in counseling. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, Discovered that that's not gonna be wasn't really gonna get me a lot, as far as work wise and career wise and so I went back to uh, here in Park High School for a year and I took a year of math and sciences and went on to um, Conestoga College and in, in uh, they have it's in Kitchener but they have the Stratford campus so I went there for the three years. Okay. And then when I graduated there, I worked in a place called Geraldton, okay. which is 60 
16 hours north of, sun, of uh, Toronto. Like I said, it's quite a bit north, isn't it? Three hours north of Thunder Bay. Yeah, that's way up there. Yes. Um, worked there, couldn't stand the isolation, moved back. Worked for um, an organization called uh, Christian Horizons here in town in one of their group homes till 2007. Um, at which time, um, my marriage fell apart in February 2007, and, uh, I met a woman online, and she decided to move to be with me. So, um, I ended up quitting the job I was at and going to Crescent Care to make a little bit more money, because I was the only pregnant earner. So I started working at Crescent Care, um, I believe it was June 2007. Okay. And how long did you work there for? Until um, 2014. Yeah, till uh, like I think it was March 2014. And were you always in the same role? Or as a, did you as a roles at Crescent Care? Or? As a registered nurse. Yeah. And registered nurses' role is always the same. Yeah. But um, I worked in different areas of the home. Okay. There's five wings to correct the care, so I worked in different areas. Right. Okay. All throughout the, the seven or so years that you were there? Yes. Okay. And at that point, did you have different supervisors from unit to unit, or uh, no, was there was, the same person? No, there was one supervisor, Helen Crombie, she was the head nurse. Okay. And then there was, like, people under her, um, Shelley... Uh, Jeanette, um, I don't remember the rest of them. And then there was like a, an administrative head. And I think for most of that time it was Brenda. Right. Okay. Um, and then from Crescent Care, I know you've, you've had a few other... Yeah, I went from Crescent Care, fired from Crescent Care. Okay. For a, a medication area, era, okay. er, error. Okay. Yeah. Then from there I went to uh, Meadow Park Nursing Home. Okay. And uh, left there to get help with an um, addiction issue. Okay. Hoping that it would get help with that as well. Mm -hmm. And then when I came back, I started working again in January. I left, I left Meadow Park in uh, September of 2014. And I started working for a um, nursing agency called uh, Lifeguard in 2015. And I worked with them for over a year. And then in July 2016, I started working for St. Elizabeth Healthcare. Okay. As well, I was still working for um, Lifeguard. Oh, okay. And how did that work? Did you just your time between the two, um, or was it just kind of a part-time position at both organizations? Elizabeth, St. Elizabeth was my priority. Okay. So, and Lifeguard is very much, you pick up the shifts as they come. There's very few scheduled shifts, so gotcha. I can say the yes and no to them and, and focus on St. Elizabeth. And were, and were those roles where you would do, like, in-home care with different um, lines? With uh, Lifeguard, it's an agency, so you go into nursing homes, you go into people's homes, you go into, um, you go into, uh, like, retirement homes, um, you did a lot of different things, a lot of one-on-ones with people, mm -hmm. like in their own homes, 12-hour mm -hmm. shifts, 8-hour shifts, okay. sitting with them, okay. a lot of stuff I did was sitting with palliative patients. Right, okay, that would be tough. I, hey, it was okay. Yeah. Like, because I knew they were going to die, yeah. and it was just an opportunity to give the family a rest. Yeah, absolutely. So. Yeah, it's an important role. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't see it that way and wouldn't even notice the care that these people are giving from people like yourself, right? Um, yeah. So to give the families a bit of a break and, and take, take, take that role is, is important, like, which a lot of people don't see, right? Because so. when, some, when someone's dying in the house, mm -hmm. Families don't want everyone to be asleep at once, right? And that can be right. very hard if you're not able to do that. That's right. But if you have a nurse there that says, no, it's okay, I've got this, I know the medications they get, it's going to be all right, then... Everyone kind of rest easy. Yeah. Yeah. Good.
Um, back at Metal Park, what, were you, what was your addiction? Uh, I do Okay. Alright. I do Okay. And what, like how much were you using? And I was a binge user, so okay. I would use what I could get a hold of. Okay. By stealing it from the patient. Okay. Alright. And how would that work? Like, would, it, would it just be in their, in their allotted medications, or would you have access to a card to, um, to feed your There's There are some in their allotted medications. Some of them had um, confusion, so they couldn't tell the difference between what those you were giving them, so I'd give them a lot to do instead of their hydromorphs. Okay. Um, there was uh, a lot of them had as needed, so it would be in a big card. Mm -hmm. And then they'd say, I would just punch out that, oh, Barney needed two of those today, and oh, Billy needed three of those today when they really didn't. Okay. And that's how I would get a hold of it. Okay. Every once in a while, there was also a um, drug, book, a dr big drug uh, holder, like a safe almost, that we would put the drugs in. Okay. Once, uh, like, if somebody died, yep. and there were, like, 23 hydromorphs left would slide the whole card into the drug holder. Well, if you picked it up and turned it upside down and shook it, you'd get drugs back out of it. Okay. Right. So. so you had your ways? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and was that ever an issue with, with that? Were we ever confronted? Or, or I did, was did that go totally undetected for the, the time you were there? There was a time when um, Hydromorph was delivered to the home and it didn't get put away right away by the person who should have. Mm -hmm. And so I took the hydromorph mm -hmm. and put it in my bag and took it home. Okay. And it wasn't discovered for months. Okay. And uh, so I just played down. Okay. When the police told me about it, I played down. Yeah. And that was that? Yeah. Okay. So as a binge, a binge user then, like how much would you would you be using on a, I mean obviously you wouldn't use it on a daily basis if you're binge yeah. using, but like how long did the addiction last for? Oh, the addiction lasted from I think it started in two thousand and eight. Okay. So to two thousand and fourteen, at which time I went away and got treatment at a treatment center. Okay. But then uh I started using again probably from January two thousand and sixteen I started using again. Okay. And are you still using when you get your hands on them or no. No. Um no. uh I'm going to stop using alcohol as well. I'm going to, I have friends in AA, and I'm, I've got a very clear plan. If, if I'm able to be out and about, right. I have a very clear plan. And I also know if I'm not able to be out and about, that AA and Narcotics Anonymous do have some programs where they come into prison. Absolutely. So, yeah. that's my plan. Well, that's, that's good that you have a plan. Um, what do you think? What do you think the reason is that you slipped into the addiction back in the week? Like, what, 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 um, is it just the stresses of the job that you were facing, yeah, or dealing yeah, with just, your personal life as well? And just always feeling like I had to be the best possible person, and very, very stressful job, giving medications to 32 people, um, making sure treatments were done on 32 people, right. charging for 32 people, supervising four PSWs who sometimes didn't always get along. And sometimes I always didn't always get along with me. Yeah. Um, it's a hard job. Any nurse will say it's a hard job. I believe it 100%. And uh, then they would add different things like, oh, you have to do this and that to say who's here and counting the medications at the end of the shift. And it was a hard job. And, and I, I just, I always was putting this pressure on myself to be a really good nurse and to do everything perfectly. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, when I could get a hold of a hydromark or two and take it, then that pressure was gone. Right. And um, the treatment center that you went away to, where was that? I cannot remember. Okay. I've tried and tried to remember. Yeah. Um, was it local or? No, it was, a, it was at a town that was like two a good two hour drive. Okay. You know where the locks are? Yeah. Near Niagara Falls. Welland. Welland? Yeah. It's a little town outside of Welland. Okay. And it's, they have a, it's an 18 day treatment that they have and I, I was successful. I went through the whole thing. Nice. So all 18 days? Yes. Okay. And it helps? Yes. Yep. 
What about family? Uh, you're born and raised in Woodstock? Yeah, born and raised in Woodstock, uh, married from, 2000 and, uh, from 97 to 2007. Okay. We broke up um, February 2007. No children. I wanted them, he never did. My mom and dad are in their 70s, 75 and 76. I have cousins all over the area. Um, and uh, my brother and his wife and four kids, they live in uh, okay. And they're, um, well, they're, they're quite active. The oldest one is 26, and he's got a, a wife and two kids. He lives with his parents. They all live with the parents, except for my... Oh, is that right? Yeah, just one big yeah. house of crazy. Can family, huh? Have you been out to visit at all, Benavides, or...? Um, I've been to see their house once. Yeah. They've been here a few times. Nice. They came in 2013 for my parents' uh, 50th wedding anniversary. Nice. And um, my nephew and his wife stayed behind and lived with my parents for a few months while my nephew tried to go to Bible college. Okay. But he wasn't successful, so they went back. Yeah. So your brother older or younger than you? Older. He's three years older than me. Okay. He's 50, 52. Right on. Good. Um, so as far as your latest position at um, St. Elizabeth, yeah. that was your last position as a RN, is that yes, correct? Yes, it was. Okay. Yes. And you said you resigned from there? Yes. Okay. What, what brought you to that? That's, that, that's where things get a little crazy. Okay. This is part that I haven't told the doctors. Because um, it seems so stupid now. When my ex and I broke up in 2007, I was already taking the medication for my, for my borderline personality disorder. And I was so angry. And it was like a voice said inside me, I'll use you, don't worry about it. And the different times that I have caused people's deaths or caused them discomfort through the um, through the insulin, I believe it was the influence of that voice or whatever it was. It wasn't a voice in my head, it was a voice in here. And when I would do it afterwards, I would hear like a laughter in my chest. So, I started working for St. Elizabeth, and I was doing well, but it was a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And the way that, you know, that I've helped people left to die has been through insulin. And uh, after my first, my 30-day evaluation, my, uh, my uh, supervisor came to me and said, you know, I'm really sorry. We want you for Woodstock, but we have so many kids in the schools in Ingersoll that need help with their insulin pumps that you're going to start working in Ingersoll. Okay. And I panicked. I panicked. I didn't want to do that. Because okay. I felt, you know, what if? Those are kids. So about, I think it was about a week after that that I quit. Yeah. And then I, uh, I packed my stuff in the car, mm -hmm. and I drove two days into Co I drove into Quebec, mm -hmm. thinking like I would just sort of run away sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, no, that's just stupid. So I came back, and uh, I was going to tell my parents what was going on, but they had visitors from Scotland, so I didn't tell them. I just <laughs> sorry mm -hmm. spent two weeks pretending to go to work. Okay. Most of the visitors in right. Scotland were here. Right. It's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> and then um, once they left, I, did, I decided I didn't want to nurse anymore. I didn't want to hurt anybody anymore. So I also quit my other job. And then I decided, um, well, whatever Friday that was, that like I did a lot of looking into how I could get help that I realized I needed help with whatever this was. Because right. part of me had started to believe that it was the devil. Mm -hmm. 
and part of me thought it might be God was the purpose through my life. And uh, I know the doctor asked me those questions, but I didn't answer them because I was so ashamed. But I just, uh, I didn't want this to keep going on. So I quit both jobs. Looked into where I could get help. Dr. Fernando is my uh, psychiatrist, and he's not a very nice man. So I went on an online uh, support group and was talking on to people on there, and they were saying, you know, get some help. So then I started researching some uh, psych boards and stuff, and I saw Can H, and they are the only um, mental health facility in Ontario that has an emergency department. Okay. So I made a decision, and I went I went there one Friday morning. I took the train, and off I went. And before I went, I told um, two I told three people what was going on. My uh, friend from AA, okay. and um, my uh, friend. Uh, I told them what was going on. They said, yes, go and get help. And my friend drove me to the train station. And, and when you say you told them what was going on, did you get into details I, of why I you were going to that, seek help? Or? I told them that I had been killing people. Them, and they all said, yes, you better go get help. So off I went. Okay. And? She's a friend from uh, when I used to work at...
medications are you on right now? I'm taking um, fluvoxamine. It's called Luvox, 200 milligrams. It's uh, anti-obsessional and an antidepressant. Okay. I'm taking 300 milligrams of Seroquel, which is um, an antipsychotic. And they upped that when I was at KNH, okay. which has really helped clear my thinking. Has it? Good. And then I'm taking a couple of blood pressure medications, and then I've got some loxapine for when I get really agitated. Okay. And when we left the hospital, you had taken, I believe, some Ativan, is that right? I took two milligrams of Ativan when we left the hospital. Right. Okay. Which was, you guys noted the time, 1.30 yeah. or something That's like that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I've had nothing since. Okay. And I know that the doctor, uh, Dr. Conn, provided with, with a prescription that... Yeah. And he up. also gave me two loxapines. Yeah. And was very strict. I am not to take them till all the interviews are over. Okay. Because they will start to interfere with my thinking. Okay. And then let me see the interview. Yeah. Exactly. And do you feel that you're of a clear sound mind right now? Yes, I do. Conversing with me in this, in this room? Yes. Yeah. And, and everything that you're telling me is, is the truth and the best that you can remember? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, could, I could appreciate where you're coming from as far as the work that you, you went through. Um, obviously, I've never been a nurse and I've never worked in, in the profession that you that you did, but I could imagine how overwhelming it is. Yes. Yeah. Um, having a lot of responsibility, uh, maybe not having the support of, of the administration or your, or your supervisors, you know, just kind of go out and get it done, right? Yeah. And, uh, and that could be, I can see how that would be stressful and I can see how that would drive you maybe into your addiction and, and to other things. But um, I want to just go over this document, if that's okay, okay with you. Yeah. Okay, would you be willing to do that with me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you, 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 you do your thing. Sorry. No, no, don't be sorry. Absolutely not. This is pretty, excuse me, major. I've only ever had parking tickets. I've never been arrested for anything. Well, like I said, you're not under arrest right oh, now, but it is, a, it is a very significant investigation you're right. I understand. Okay. And like I said before, Beth, I, I do appreciate you uh, speaking with us. And I can imagine that, uh, does it feel like a weight off your shoulders? Yes. So yes you've been yes. carrying a burden for quite some time. And I've tried to get help a couple of times. Yeah. Well, Sometimes it takes a few attempts to to finally commit to it, right? Yeah, I had a pastor that I told me, he prayed over me and told me I'd be fine. And that was God's grace. And then When was that? That was uh, Halloween 2013. Okay. Yeah. And you, you kind of divulged to what had happened to, your, to you to that point in your life with yeah. involving these people? Yeah. Okay. And where was that? That was here in town. Do you want his name? If you want to tell me, it's up to you. Uh, oh no, sorry, it wasn't. Did I just say 2014? Mm -hmm. It was 2013. Okay. All right. So, so be before we get into this, um, I know that there's a statement which we have and that I've watched where you attended the police station in Toronto, that's yes. 52 Division, is that correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. And I honestly, I think it was Detective Hamilton and I honestly can't remember the other detective's name. Now. I know it started with an A. Um, and you met with them for, uh, uh, I was going to say about an hour and a half. That was nuts. <laughs> yeah. And at that point, you had in your possession um, a photocopy of this document, yes. right? Okay. And you went through and you read it out. Yes. Okay. And then following that, they started uh, with the first name on the list, and they wanted to just try and get a little bit more detail of yes. of, of the involvement in each circumstance, okay. in each death, right? Okay. That's what I'd like to do today, and just get some more detail. Okay. Okay. So. It's a long list. It is. It is, but I think that to you and I, I think we can get through it together. Yep, I'm and, sure we can. As long as you're patient with me. I, I've got all the time to look. I'm not going anywhere. Because I'm physically comfortable. It's a nice chair, but... Yeah. Well, anytime up. you need to get up and wander around, if you, like I said, if you want to take a break and uh, have me leave and just kind of stretch your legs and whatever the case may be, you go ahead. Okay. okay. If you have to use your washroom at any time, just let me know. All right. Okay? Because like I said, I'm 
I'm here as, as long as we need to be. Okay. Okay, and I'm not pressuring you to uh, to stay any longer than you want to, but I think that uh, I think if we just kind of sit down and go through this, like I said, we'll get through it together. Yes. I'm, uh, I'm a pretty patient person, and I'm here to just listen to what you have to tell me, okay? Okay. Okay, and like I said, I, I appreciate it. Okay? So, um, how about we just do this together? I'll just bring this over here. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. So I'm not going to have you read through this entire document because I've already ha you already did that, right? I have written it. I have read it. I have you know lived it. So. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Mr. Silcox. Yes. Yeah. Okay. September of 2007. Yeah. Okay. The first one that died as a result of what I did. Okay. And and before you get into that, you have signed some kind of page numbers, all that kind of stuff on yeah. these documents. So we'll just go in order of, of how you've written it. Okay. And I know that the detectives in uh, in Toronto kind of had this in their possession and just kind of got you to recall some things. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to keep it here because, I mean, you've already written this out. So yeah. what's on here is we already know that. Um, I just have some follow-up questions as, okay. as, as with regards to each circumstance. So Mr. Silcox, um, it says here you were working at a double shift uh, from 3 to 7, right? 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. Right. Okay. And this was at Crescent Care? Yes. Yeah. In Woodstock. Yes. Okay. And tell me about your your knowledge of, of James and and your daily interactions during a shift with him. Um, I didn't see him every time. He wasn't always my patient. I just knew from what uh, people had said that he would grab the the nurse's uh, breasts and buttocks and he would say horribly inappropriate things about his wife. That now he was there, you know, um, he was gonna fuck all of us. She was gonna fuck all of Woodstock. And, this would say the correct thing, and he did touch me inappropriately once. And where was that? On, on my your breast. Body? On your breast, okay. And were you alone in the room at that point? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, did he have a roommate at all? Did you have a roommate? I, he must have. He wasn't in the same room. Okay. So he was either in a double room or a quadruple room. Okay. Would you remember any other residents that would be roomed with him at that time? Or? No. No. Okay. No. That's okay. Um, what portion of the home would, would, was James in at this point? He was in the, okay, the east wing, the south wing, north wing. He was in the north wing, mm -hmm. about halfway down, and he was either in a double bed or a quadruple bed. Okay. All right. And um, the, the diagnosis of, of his health at the, at the time you were caring for him, do you remember? He was post-hip surgery and he had dementia. Do you remember how old he was approximately? No, I don't. I didn't see him in his 80s. In his 80s? Yeah. Okay. And, sorry, he was not a diabetic? Not a diabetic. And, sorry, you said he had dementia? Yes. Yeah. Okay, which you've also noted here as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about the night. Uh, was this the first person that you did this to? That I that I tried. Well, there were other people that I did it to who didn't die. Prior to James? Prior to James. Okay, and he's are they documented on here? He's the first one who died. Right. Uh, Back then, here? But there's some other... People who didn't die. Right, so I can't read that first name. I so till they Adriana? Okay, so that was, I mean, they're both September oh, 2007, but that was yeah. before James? Yeah. Okay. So was this your first attempt at, at overdosing these people on insulin? Yes, Clotilda was. Just Clotilda. And I didn't really want her to die. I just, I don't know, I was just angry and um, had this sense inside me that she may be a person that God wanted back with them. Okay. And is that that feeling you're referring to that you had in your stomach yeah. at times? Yeah. Okay. Is that is that the point, and I hate to get off to a topic here, but the point where you had these feelings in your stomach and almost that laughter after it happened, Yeah. is that the part that you didn't tell Dr. Khan? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to be clear on that. I told him about the laughter in my stomach, but not the feeling that this may be the person that God wants. Okay. It's your feelings, right? Mm hmm I honestly felt like God wanted to use me. And he kept Dr. Khan kept asking me, Do you think God chose me for a special purpose? I kept saying no. Because that did not sound like a special purpose. You know? Yeah. So but yeah, I just had a sense after my marriage broke up that God was gonna use me for something. And then after a while I started to really wonder after some of the murders, mm -hmm. if it was God or if it was the devil fooling me. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you were doing the right thing for these people? No. 
I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do, but it wasn't what was right for them. Um, so James, then, um, it was an evening that this one took place, right? Yeah. Um, it says here at about 9.30. Yeah. Run me through. About 9.30, I gave him a dose of uh, 50 milligrams of insulin. He's not, not diabetic. So I went into it. I used a borrowed insulin pen, borrowed insulin, and gave him an insulin shot. And at 3.30, the TSW, well, throughout the night, he was yelling out, I love you, and I'm sorry. And not, to, not to me, but just you could hear him calling out in this room, and that's what he was calling out. Mm -hmm. And then at 3.30, the uh, TSWs came to me and said that he was gone. So I did what we're supposed to do. I went and listened to his heart and chest, called the doctor, called the family because that's what they wanted. Family came in to sit with him for a while. Doctor came in and uh, said that his cause of death was from um, an embolism due to his uh, post hip. He'd had a he'd had hip surgery. Doctor ruled that embolism due to post hip surgery. Um, who do you think he was talking to when he was yelling, I, I love you? I thought it might be his, his family. Okay. I really did. And when they came in and talked to me, they wanted to know if he'd said anything. Right. So I told them that I was so ashamed. Yeah. So ashamed. Yeah. When you were speaking with the family? Yeah. Okay. And is that the uh, the family that kind of commended you for the work that you had done? And yes, and that I've been there for him. Yes. How would that make you feel? Awful. Absolutely awful. How did you deal with it? Um, I just went home and went to bed. You know, I felt awful. Maybe I fought with my girlfriend. Did some exercising, you know. Yeah. Played some games on the computer and just tried to forget about it. Did you have a, uh, have a problem sleeping that night at all? Or, you know, um, or did you? Well, I was working nights, so I was... Um, you were during the day then? Um, I would say I tossed and turned a bit, yeah. I felt pretty bad. And I didn't want to see the family again. So I tried to make sure I wasn't working when they came to pick up his stuff and I wasn't. And what room? Do you remember the, like a room number or just like you No, it was down in our phone. The wing, yeah. Okay. When you and where did you get the insulin from for James, for Mr. Stilcox? You said you had taken some insulin. Um, and where did you get those? The insulin was kept in a fridge. In the medication room. Okay. We had two medication rooms. And so it was kept in the fridge in the medication room. And uh, extra pens were kept in the drawer. So you could just say somebody you had someone admitted and you needed a pen in a hurry. So you just put the insulin in the pen and, and put the needle on and dial up the dose and give it. And how was that documented to know that, so that Carson Care would know that you were taking that insulin? They didn't keep track of him. Okay. So it was just uh, something that was available for the nurses' use when they knew that it was appropriate for the certain patients. Yes. Now each patient has their own insulin. Right. And maybe somebody noticed, somebody may have noticed that a lot of insulin was missing if a lot was used, but I was always careful to use different people. Okay. Different people's insulin. Insulin, yes. Okay. All right. And Mr. Silcox, then, where, where did you inject the insulin into his body? I'm not really sure. I'm going to say his arm or his uh, torso. And did he know what was going on at that point? Not really. Was he uh, was he a verbal patient? Like could he could converse oh, yeah. with you he, and he communicate? He didn't really converse. He did a lot of yelling out. I don't really remember him reacting when I gave it to him. So he didn't react. I I don't remember him reacting. No. Would he maybe just think it's a, a regular portion of his day and Probably. receiving the medications that he, he so required? Probably for the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there anything else you can remember about Mr. Silcox? Um, his wife and daughter loved him a lot. Mm -hmm. And how does that make you feel? Crappy. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Um, he, yeah, like I said, he could be a bit of a handful, but, you know, he ate and drank normally, he took his pills when he told him to, 
So nothing else I can really remember about him. But this is, you know, nine years ago. So. It's a while ago. Yeah. How long after, sorry, when did you break up with your, your husband? I it, broke up with August him. August 2007? Oh, no, no. I broke up with him in uh, end of January, beginning of February 2007. Okay. Okay, so it was quite some time until September until you actually... Yeah. All right, I guess. By that time, I was in a new relationship with a woman. Okay. Who was that? Her name was Maureen. Did you ever disclose to her what you were doing? No, absolutely not. So you just kind of went about your thing with Mr. Silcox? Yeah. Um, went home that day, did your kind of some exercise and computer games, went to sleep. Did you work again that next day? I don't remember. Don't remember. Do you remember who you would have been working with on that occasion? No. No? No, I don't. I'm sorry. Okay. Are you okay? Yeah. Do you want to get yeah. up and stretch? I just do a lot of fidgeting. Okay, that's okay. Hey. You're not bothering me. I just want to make sure that you're comfortable. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay. If I need something, I'll do it. Okay. You betcha. Do you remember who your supervisor would have been at that point? Well, that would be Helen Rombe. That was the head nurse? Yeah, she was always, like, whoever was on as the nurse was the charge nurse. Okay. So I was the charge nurse. Mm -hmm. And at night, so I, as the charge nurse from 3 to 11, I was in charge of uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight PSWs, mm -hmm. and I was ever, yeah, and then there was two other wings, and so at night, as a church nurse, I was responsible to look after the um, RPN on the other side, like the urethra server. Okay. There were four PSWs on that side and four PSWs on my side, so nine people. Okay. And then Mrs. Prombe, of course, she was around with me. Okay. She's with these. Yeah. But yeah. so she's who we all, she's who we all answered to. Okay. She was, her and the executive director, Brenda, I don't remember her last name. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm probably going to... That's fine. Right. So, as far as Mr. Silcox goes, then, besides what you were feeling in your stomach, and besides that you thought that this was a purpose that you were given on from your relationship for after breaking up with your husband, right? Yeah. That you, that you, you, you indicated that he wasn't a very nice man. No, he wasn't. Did, is that a portion of um, what happened? I don't know. I wonder if that's a portion of how I chose him. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, I did feel a release and a release. Mm -hmm. Like a release of pressure. Okay. Because throughout this document, and, and as we go through it, a lot of these people, you kind of describe them as, as not very nice people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I'm not sure if that's a tendency or a, a pattern that we see as far as, is that why you chose these people? Yeah, I'm not, it might be, but I also know I just felt like they were the ones. Right. I had a feeling inside that they were the ones. Before before you injected insulin in Mr. Silcox, was it a spur of the moment thing? Had you thought about it that uh, when you reported for duty at three o'clock in the afternoon? Um, I started thinking about it about six at night, I think. Okay. And do you remember who the pronouncing doctor would have been? No. Like how, did that, how did that process work? That process, the way it worked was a uh, person found with no vital signs. Nurse goes in with a stethoscope, mm -hmm. listens for one minute. If there's no heartbeat, no uh, lung sounds, nurse goes and calls the doctor on call. Okay. Um, there was also a sheet that we had to fill out if we thought it was a coroner's case. Mm -hmm. In this case, I don't believe we thought it was. And then... Um, Family is called, and the doctor may wait to come in and uh, pronounce in the morning. Oh, okay. Family can come in and visit the body at any time. Okay. So then the PSWs would get the the body ready. Okay. So prior to the doctor announcing in the morning, the family could come in and yeah. spend time. Yeah. So the PSWs would just clean them up, put on uh, you know, clean, clean bridges and right. clean up the bed and stuff. Right. So you said 
You said Mr. Silcox, you said we didn't think it was a coroner's case. Who, who, who's the oh, what that been? I guess I'm using the royal we. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> okay. So would that be just a decision that you were trying um, to make? No, there's a there's a form okay. on the computer, and you go down through it, and if it says, if you take off anything that says yes, you notify the coroner. Okay. All right. But you would have clicked off those boxes yourself? Yes. Okay. So obviously, knowing that you had done this to Mr. Silcox, did you feel that you wouldn't click yes so that attention wouldn't be drawn to you? You know, I honestly can't remember if he was a coroner case or not. Okay. He might have been. Now, would insulin... Is I would... I, even though I did this to these people, when I did their... But see, it's, it's phrased as, does anyone have a reason to believe that this death was not natural? Right. So, yeah, I would click... I wouldn't click that one. If I right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. And I just wanted to clarify that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was just a question. Okay. Um... Anything else you can think about from Mr. Silfox? No. Okay. Maurice, how did you pronounce Maurice's last name? Grenat. Is it Grenat? Okay. So tell me a little bit about Maurice. It says that this occurred in September or, or October of 2018. Yeah. Uh, sorry, 2007. And yeah. this was at Crescent Care? Yeah. Okay. Tell me a little bit yeah. about your interaction with Maurice. He was another one who liked to grab breasts and asses. Okay. He was sometimes a, a patient of mine. See, at that time, I wasn't... I didn't have a set floor that I worked on. I worked on all the different floors of the nurse guide to fill in. Okay. So, uh, he one afternoon I was working with him and he did grab me. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I got that feeling inside that this is his time to go. So I gave him an overdose of insulin after supper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe he died the next day. And what was your shift that? Do you remember what shift it you were working at that point? It was 3 to 11. 3 p.m.? Yeah, to 11 p.m. To 11 p.m. So, like so he, died, he died when I wasn't there. Okay. And he was known for, it says you're grabbing the staff's breasts and asses. Yeah. Okay. And do you remember who you would have been working with at that point? No. Okay. Do you remember um, where Maurice was within Crescent Care? Yeah, he was down in the north wing. I think he was in a in a double room on the right hand side. Okay. Yeah. And do you remember who and his then, roommates would have been at all? No, I don't. But I do remember that when he started going downhill after the insulin overdose, they moved him to the palliative care room right by the uh, nurse's desk. Okay. And at what point of the day do you think that you? Sorry, I think you said this already, but just to confirm what. What time of the day do you think it was when you had injected him with the insulin? injection? Um, it was afternoon, beginning at 4.30, 5.30. Okay. All right. Um, and what was his reaction to receiving the insulin? Again, it was just kind of like, oh, okay. I just said, the doctor wants you to have a vitamin shot. Okay. That's what I usually say. And was he able to communicate? Was he verbal? He was, he was verbal. Could converse? Not... Totally, but he could say some things, yeah. Okay. Um, and did he question his vitamin shot at all? No. Um, and he passed away the next day? Yeah. Okay. So, being that you weren't there when he had passed away, you wouldn't have been the one checking the boxes. That's right. So, do you know, by chance, what nurse would have been responsible for uh, Mr. Uh, Burnett? No, I don't. No? no. Okay. Did you ever have any concerns that he didn't pass away while you were working and that, you know, physician may arise? No, I know I didn't. I, well, yes, I did a little bit. I always wondered if they'd find the site where I gave the shot and something, you know, they, there'd be an investigation. I always wondered that. Right. But I was not, no. And even though it, it, it passed through your mind, did you just and continued just, on about your duties? Yep. Yeah. And do you remember what part of the body he would have been injected in? Oh, maybe the leg. Because at that point he didn't have a lot of body fat. So. Maurice didn't know. He didn't know. And when you give a, a subcutaneous injection, it goes in to the body fat. So. Okay. And you documented that he was a cancer patient? Yes. Okay. 
Do you remember what type of cancer he had? I think it was prostate. Prostate? Prostate, yes. Yeah. Okay. And what was the what did the outcome uh, hold for his future as far as the, the cancer in his body? He was dying. Awesome. How old do you think Maurice was? 75, 76. Okay. I'm sorry, you were in a double room? Yeah, I believe it was a double room, yeah. Okay. Do you remember who you had been working with that day? No. Same supervisor, or the head nurse? No. Sorry, I'm... That's I, okay. It's so far... It, it's a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, obviously it's a significant event in your life, but it's a yeah. long time ago. Yeah. So I, I, no, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not concerned that you can't remember every question that I ask you. That's, you just, if you can do the best that you can, that's all I can ask for. Okay. Okay.